Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by FreshBooks, the simple cloud accounting solution that's helping millions of entrepreneurs and small business owners save time. Go to getfreshbooks.com and use the offer code TWIST for a free 30 days. And by Moo, an online print and design company that helps you stand out from the crowd. Moo creates premium quality, customizable business cards and promotional materials. Visit moo.com slash twist for more details and to get 20% off your next order. Hey everybody, as part of our incubator series, we have two amazing guests on today's This Week in Startups. The first is Gil Pinchina. You know who he is. He has the largest AngelList syndicate, even bigger than my own, and he has done dozens of investments, and he has a very honest and blunt talk with me about angel investing um, and his crazy life. It's really interesting. Steve Huffman is the co-founder of Reddit and Hipmunk, and he has a talk with me about what it takes to build companies. The incubator is going fabulous. We're about five, six weeks into it, and all these companies uh, in the incubator will be launching at the Launch Festival on March 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. So I figured, why not let you hear the same talks that those seven companies are hearing? It's an amazing episode. Stick with us. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all how it feeds my people yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals Until we get the money, spend the money And defeat you yeah. Money is the root of all evil what? Funny how it feeds my people yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals Until we get the money, spend the money And defeat you Uh, Gil Pinchina has, as I said, uh, an amazing record as an investor, angel investor, and is now one of two um, people who are really uh, tearing it up on the Angelist Syndicate, me uh, being the second. And so um, I think it's great to talk a little bit and start there, because syndicates have captured people's imagination. How many have you done, and what is the average amount of money raised? in the range uh, so I'll take a step back I, I started a syndicate because this guy named Naval who started AngelList called a bunch of people and said hey you should do one it's so, a good pitch yeah <laughs> right um, so as with many things it, it, it pays to be open to ideas and not necessarily reject things that sound incredibly stupid at the time um, I now run a dozen syndicates um, the biggest of which can write a five million dollar check when I put in my usual sort of twenty five thousand dollars, which is crazy. Um, and then I run a late stage syndicate, SaaS, Bitcoin, fintech, ad tech. We're launching marketplaces. We launched one just for the UK. Uh, we're basically trying to build the fidelity of this asset class now. Any hypothesis you have for where you want to put your money, we're going to have funds and fund managers digging in and trying to find it. So, you know, health tech, ed tech, other things like that are on the list, obviously. Um, so that's sort of what we're doing. Um, we put, at last count, about $8 million to work this year, which when you consider the fact that syndicates didn't even launch till like, I don't know, February or March. March. <laughs> I think I did my first in May. You had yeah, two, so three. I probably did one in March or April for a couple hundred grand. And, uh, you know, at the time, one of my backers was Mickey Mouse, who was in for 2K a deal. Um, so I yeah. kind of thought it was a joke. Um, yeah, anybody could sign up at the beginning. Yeah, it was awesome. Um, <clears throat> so we did $8 million and we're on a run rate of 2 to $3 million a month right now. Um, so it's, so it's like growing. A, it's like a venture firm. Yeah, if I, a venture firm took four or five years to deploy their capital. It would be a hundred million dollar venture firm. Uh, would totally. Except I. So one of the things I find as a founder, and I, I've like realized in the last few months, I'm sort of a founder of this company that is syndicate stuff. Um, is you have to be able to sort of come up with a grandiose vision that makes everyone nod and go like, oh, okay, I get it. I know what you're doing. I know why it's important. I get it. Explain what that is. Yeah. So we're building sort of Fidelity meets Andreessen, right? Got it. It's, a, it's not Andreessen. It's 50 
Andreessen's that are each going to compete with every other venture fund out there. They're going to be sector focused, they're going to be stage focused, some of them will be personality focused. We actually now manage syndicates for other people, so if any of you want to start a syndicate, we will help you become awesome and a baller the way Jason is. <laughs> um, and so we actually have several people now who are, are in our sort of fund management house in the same way that celebrity fund managers go from T. Rowe to Fidelity to PIMCO, right? There was that PIMCO guy who just left who's super famous. So a Tim Ferriss might be like, work with you, work with somebody else, whatever. Mm -hmm. Not that he is, but uh, or not, I don't know. Um, but so what is the main difference for a founder in taking a half million dollars from one of your syndicates and taking a half million dollars from a VC or angels? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so with the syndicates, some come some more transparency, like people find out what you're doing, whereas sometimes you take money from VCs and you can sort of hide it or not talk about it for a while. So, you know, we do have a little more of a, a transparency uh, built into the system that we operate in. Um, and How does that manifest? Well, so you, monthly you, update? No, more just that you have to put your fundraising and put enough information to convince people it's not a completely colossally bad idea. Right. Um, so instead of convincing one person, you're convincing, right. you're convincing a group. Yeah, um, but but all that's done through automation and email, so you don't actually talk to all these people. Um, the other thing that happens is if you're talking to a small syndicate and they're saying, hey, can we put $500,000 in? They may not actually raise 500000 right? The money's not committed. Hmm. You know, if you're talking to Jason or me, you know, 500000 is like a small portion of our backers. It's relatively easy for us to raise a half a million dollars. Um, but I had a $5 million allocation in November, and I couldn't raise all of it, right? So, you know, we all have our limits. So that is one of the things is you, you sort of have to range bound how much money you can raise from a syndicate. And Whereas Andreessen and Horowitz can say, yes, say, we have a billion million dollars, dollars. Here's $50 million. Right. Here so they're, you know, they're, they're bigger than we are, and that gives them power we don't have yet, but give us time. Um, is there upside um, that, or what is the upside of a syndicate over, say, a VC? Yeah, so, so when I go out and compete to try to invest in companies like yours, um, I say a couple things. One, you know, I think I can be helpful, but, you know, people are human and there's only so much of my time. So what we've been doing is we've actually been building a way to replicate all the value that VCs add through software and crowdsourcing. So I have 1,500 backers across the 12 funds now. And when you want something promoted, you've got a coupon, you've got a new product launch, you've got, you're entering a new city. Um, 1,500 people get a note to come to our software platform and promote that on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. When you have a job posting, the second product we're in the process of building right now is all your job postings will just flow into our system. And instead of, you know, I don't know if you guys have been serial entrepreneurs or not, but when I was running a company, angels would email me resumes <clears throat> for jobs I didn't have a job posting for. And then I'd end up going to meet some guy or a lady because it was impolite to say no. In our system, your job posting triggers a request for a LinkedIn URL and a text field. Give us a candidate, tell us why they're a good candidate. And so you or your recruiting manager can quickly go through by job posting. Here's people that the backers think would be good for you. Here's why they think they're good. And here's the name of the backer if you want a warm introduction. So again, trying to sort of automate and make easier the process. And you know, even board members do shitty jobs of, of recruiting, but 1,500 people can do a better job. And then we're going to do the same thing for introductions. That's sort of the third product that's still in, in wireframes right now. And so when I go around pitching now, I say, look, you can take money from anyone. And there are lots of good VCs, and there are lots of not so good VCs. Um, our difference is, who would you rather take money from? Six dorky white guys in blue jackets or 1,500 entrepreneurs like us. Yeah. I don't know about you, but like the dorky white, you know, blue jacket guys are, you know, they're kind of a pain sometimes. Experience would say that they can be a pain sometimes. Yeah, they're, and helpful sometimes. I mean, some of my yeah, best I mean, friends it, are VCs. Exactly. And then that is the, the great disparity is like they're, right. they're, it's a small subset of people with a large amount of power and a large amount of money, mm -hmm. so a lot, therefore a large impact on startups. And there's great variability on an individual basis 
let alone on a firm basis, yep. within firms even. Ah, uh, yes, FreshBooks is a friend of entrepreneurs and independent contractors everywhere. You have to invoice people because you need to get paid. If you're a consultant, a designer, a developer, and you don't want to be opening up a Google Doc and just cutting and pasting and making errors, no. You want to track everything in a beautiful system like FreshBooks so you don't make mistakes. And FreshBooks is not just for invoicing your clients and saying, hey, I did 10 hours. It's for actually tracking the hours you did. So when you're on the site, you can say, hey, I worked this hour to this hour, this hour to this hour, and have it automatically build the invoice for you. How slick is that? And then if you have expenses, you can also track your expenses in there. Oh, I bought this stock photo for this client. Oh, I bought this book for this client. I bought this hardware for that client. I bought this software for another client. It organizes it all beautifully and simply. And FreshBooks, you hear the radio ads, you hear people talking about it. It's super affordable and easy to use. The founder made this because he was making mistakes on his invoices. The company's done tremendous because, like a lot of software as a services companies, they focus on one thing, one problem, and then they just do it better and better and better and add more and more elegant features. And that's the magic of FreshBooks. Go ahead uh, and go to freshbooks.com. Um, and I'm sorry, getfreshbooks.com and use the promo code TWIST when they say, how did you hear about us? And you'll get a um, 30-day uh, free trial. That's right. No obligation. Uh, getfreshbooks.com and enter the code TWIST. I got it. Yeah, getfreshbooks.com. Promo code TWIST. Time tracking, expense tracking, all that kind of stuff. It's uh, really easy to do, and you can do it all on your phone. So if you're mobile, you can do it like that as well. Thanks again to FreshBooks for sponsoring independent media like This Week in Startups. Say thank you, uh, FreshBooks, on your Twitter handle and get freshbooks.com. Use the promo code TWIST. Okay, uh, let's get back to this amazing episode. And then there's board seats. Um, I don't yeah, how think do you, you typically that? take them. We're taking an option on them if we I think we're going to. What does yeah. that mean? It will like I'll decide later. Exactly, like we have a window to take a board seat or something uh, if we have over a certain amount of ownership potential. Yeah, I view it the other way around, which is I don't want to be in control of you. I want you to be in <clears throat> control of you. And if for some reason you think I'm really helpful, you're damn well gonna have to convince me I'm gonna be really helpful because I'm kind of busy. Yeah. Um, so if I don't trust you. Like, what's the point? So the criticism has been with these party rounds. Hunter yeah. Walk's written about it. Mm -hmm. You know, he's written about two things. The piggy round the, and the, the... piggy round. The piggy round is like, we're going to close around without telling anybody and okay. squeeze out the other investors and yeah. nobody even knows we did it. Yep. And then the party round is everybody invests and then forgets the name of the founder and the company. Yep. So, you know, again, the, the, I, I would just say the party round. So <coughs> I talk to VCs and they're like, I can't believe you're not taking board seats. Like, that's ridiculous. And, and my response is board seats have two purposes in my mind, at least when I was an entrepreneur and I went to my first board meeting and I expected this gray-haired council of elders to give me advice and tell me the answers to all of humanity's problems. Um, and what I found was a group of fairly emotional people who were trying to score points and make themselves look good and were more concerned about internal VC partner politics than they were about me. Uh, and often didn't remember what happened to the last board meeting or my favorite board member who came to every third board meeting and asked questions that had been answered in previous board meetings he hadn't been to, to the point where I actually kicked him off the board. Um, I think board members serve two purposes, speaking as an investor now, right? The first is the fiduciary responsibility to control and keep the crazy person from doing crazy things with our money. You know, there's a set of people that I would only invest in if I could take a board seat. They're generally crazy. Most people you back aren't. Mm -hmm. They may be risk-seeking, but they're not crazy. Um, and then there's the desire to add value and give advice. And I think we're going to try to do that through the crowd and through all the software we're building. And, and so I'm sort of getting rid of that part and limiting it to... Boy, I would only invest if I sort of can keep an eye on this guy because it makes me a little nervous. And even then, I would probably resort to the Josh Koppelman version, which is I'm the board member for the length of this project, this project being defined as getting you your next round of funding where someone else will be the board member. Um, oh, so moving. Like, so I need to sort of keep an eye on this. Like I have one, I've taken two board seats in the last year year and a half. And in both cases, it's like, I'm a board member for a while, but I don't necessarily see myself as a board member for life. 
Yeah. Um, and so startups today, what attracts you? You know, so sort of same question with Steve, you know, what are the tells either way? Like, hey, this person, I can't not fund them. <laughs> you know, like I, I feel like I have to write a check right now. And then the opposite, I cannot wait for this to end. I got to get out of this meeting. Really? Well, give me, give me both. Like, what, what are the... I never have those. Um, you never have, like, oh, my God, this is totally not fundable. Why did I... No, because I love crazy people. I okay. Mean, that's sort of half the fun of this. Right. Um, so... So even in one that is absolutely not fundable, you can you can find... There's always a gem in there somewhere, right? Really? There is. A I don't know. Maybe I'm an optimist. Um, yeah. So... Or you have good filters. Maybe. Yeah. Um... I think ultimately what we do as entrepreneurs is an exercise in storytelling. You're, you're, you know, when I was running a company, I, I used to go, go home some days and, and bemoan the fact that I felt like, I wasn't actually, but I felt like I had lied to my investors to get them to invest and then I was lying to customers to convince them to, to do this thing that was clearly crazy, that was going to end up like falling apart and all this time they invested would be wasted that I then turned around and lied to employees to convince them to join something that was clearly not going to work, right? I mean, you're just constantly selling. You're out there all the time trying to convince people that you can bend reality, that what you're going to do is going to work, and that despite all the naysayers, us who sit there and pepper you with ridiculous questions, right, it's going to work because you're goddamn well going to make it work. Um, so I love people that that can really take something very complicated and make it super simple and make everyone go, wow, right? So the best wow investment I had in the last year was was uh, Chris at Bettable, who came in and said, you know, have you heard of Twilio? Like it's a web service that sort of lets you do stuff a lot easier. We're doing Twilio for gambling. Anyone can start real money gambling on any app anywhere in the world, make money off any game. And I was like, that's big, wow. Like, never heard of that. Nobody's done anything like that. Sounds enormous. I'm in. And risky. And crazy and regulatory yeah. and capital intensive and like, yay. Um, so those things, there's some balance there. Like, oh, my God, there's all these objections. It's a – there's regulations, et cetera. Mm -hmm. How in your mind do you balance that? Do you say to yourself like – um, no risk, no reward, or the more ha the harder it is, the more defensible it is. H how do you reconcile between, my God, it's too hard to actually get done? Um, I love a serial entrepreneur doing something that no one else will dare do. Huh. If you're a first time entrepreneur and you're 22 and you think regulation is for the birds, it gets a little more risky. Mm -hmm. But you know, those still work sometimes too. Yeah. So, you know, I, I would argue anything that two guys can't do in 12 weeks at YC, I'm a fan of. Yeah. Because two guys at YC can't do it. Right. And what do you think of the, the YCs of the world, the sort of incubators and the stuff that's coming out of there? Have you done investments in those or are you finding they're overvalued, valuations, et cetera? How do you look at them? Um, I'm completely indifferent. Um, I mean, my math, the thing that worries me as a founder is that there are, at my last count, over 100 <clears throat> U.S. and European incubators cranking out 5,000 companies a year, not to mention all the crazy people who just start companies because they want to. So let's say six, seven, eight thousand 8,000 companies that look like us a year, 300A rounds, do the math. Not pretty. Right. Getting to that A round. Get, and so I, I, one of the things that, like, so you, get, you if I go back to your comment on clues that, like, this is a bad sign, you know, one of the clues is we're six months from an A round and we have, you know, $5,000 a month in revenue. And I go, okay, here's someone who doesn't understand the market they're in and what it takes to raise money. And this then becomes the bridge to nowhere. Right? What, what does it take now to raise that A round, do you think, in such a hyper competitive market? I mean, A, today, the way I've heard it defined is 5 to $10 million. It's not the old $2 million A. Mm -hmm. Two is like a bridge now. Yeah. Um, five ten million dollar $10 million A in SaaS takes two hundred grand a month, give or take. Although we just did one at one fifty a month that no VC would look at yet. And I thought that mm -hmm. was fucking close to two hundred. 
It um, seems like it's, yeah, splitting hairs. Right. In consumer, I hear a lot, 10 million is the new 1 million. Like, everyone has a million users. 10 million is, like, borderline interesting. Um, you know, but the other thing that is a is a uh, just to sort of destroy some of those numbers, um, I just gave you a snapshot. The worst thing I see in a deck is a snapshot. We have five thousand users. We have five million users. We have five thousand dollars in revenue, and I go, okay, you've told me nothing. Like what I want to see is a trend line. I want pretty radical transparency. Like show me what's happening. Show me there were bumps in the road. Show me things have accelerated. Like I was looking. Show at me things have stalled. Like and why? show me something. Yeah. Um, you know, you're going to eventually get to those numbers anyway. Well, so two arguments. Well, several arguments. I'm going to get to those numbers anyway. So why be a dick and keep them from me in a way that just makes my job harder? Um, two, are you trying to fool me or get me involved, right? And being emotionally involved is a big part of the seduction process of getting an investor on board. You know, and three Unpack is... Unpack that a little bit. Yeah? Number two there, oh, the, the seduction process. I'm done. Keep going. Um, okay, go with the three, but I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm putting a pin in the seduction right, process. Um, and I guess the third one is like... Is like are you just the sort of person that, that I can have a conversation with? Or are you? am I always shadow boxing with you? Right. Straight shooter, candid. Yeah. Um, it's super important, isn't it? Now that I'm on this side of the table with you, like investing, it's like if I have to pull teeth to figure out what's going right. on, right. this just makes life hard. It just yep. makes life hard. Like when people are candid, God, you can be so much just more have a conversation and get stuff done. Right. Like it's not working or like. In case it cuts the part out, whatever. But anyway, you know, oh, with this packaging thing, is that too hard, you know, yep. or not? Like, yep. it's candid discussion is always better. So I, I was, I'm very naive, and I will try anything, right? Mm-hmm. So the first time I was a CEO, the first time I had to go out and raise money, we had a product, we had some numbers, we had a pretty thin team, lots of shit was broken, and I had a 50-page deck, which is like 40 pages too long. But what the fuck did I know? Um, 40 of those pages went into like teeth pulling detail on all the things we were doing wrong. Like it was literally like, it was one of those decks that would make Jason just be like, why am I still here? Like, can someone please call me and get me out of this meeting? Yeah. It was like, we don't have any, we haven't done any PR. Uh, we're, we've fucked up our SEO. Uh, our site goes down every day at noon. Uh, uh, here are our competitors. They have much better UI than, than we do. You should invest in them. Uh, uh, I found out our site went down at noon every day only after a month on the job because we don't have any monitoring because our only engineer is still in college. Uh, and we don't really understand our code base. And we don't have any product people. And we haven't done any product innovation. Like, I mean, oh, it's just a train wreck, right? And then I showed a series of metrics that were going like this. And I realized after people stopped laughing, um, what I told them is there's there's something here that's working. There's a core kernel that despite the buffoons in this (laughs) business, customers won't let it go. I mean, look at Craigslist. It's fucking horrible. It's impossible to use. It's ugly. It's not mobile whatever, right? Like, it works. And the core of any idea is a very, very simple thing that works. And if it works and it grows despite the obstacles, the investors who looked at my deck ultimately said, wow, fuck the A team. Like a B team could do a better job than these buffoons. If he can hire a B team, we're going to make a ton of money here. So they were like, these problems are solvable. Like, and this and the, is the magic. The core magic is fucking working despite Massive Got inefficiency, yeah. shit broken all the time. If we put like, good tires on this, we could get somewhere. Right? So I actually argue there's a theater of sort of the anti-cell, which is you know, which is what I did. And uh, but what it did is it let people really engage in the problem, and they're like, well, why haven't you fixed this? And what are you going to do about this? And then you can say, well, that's a really great idea. Like I would love to have you come and help me. It turns out you seem really smart at this. Like, you know, I, I go. suck everyone in. That so the seduction is. I present you with easy problems that make you feel smart and let you become my boss and my collaborator and help me solve them. And then you want to help me and you want to be on my side and you feel good about yourself. Mm. 
Hey everybody, I want to tell you about Moo Cards. Yes, Moo.com allows you to make beautiful, elegant business cards. Yes, everything is digital, except when you're in person and you meet somebody and they say, hey, can I have your card? That's the moment where you need a beautiful, crisp, good-looking card. And you can make these cards now for tens of dollars online at Moo.com. Go to Moo.com slash twist. And these are the beautiful small cards. You can get the big ones too, but I love the small ones, that you see people take out. Very elegant. Designers have them. CEOs have them. Venture capitalists have them. And they come in these beautiful little cases, fit right in your pocket, purse, backpack, whatever, purse, man bag, satchel. Indiana Jones had one. Don't be embarrassed if you've got one. And you just slide them open. You take this little card out. And you can make these, because they're so affordable, 20 bucks, 30 bucks a pop, you can make them event specific. So if you're coming to the launch festival or CES uh, or you know Sundance, whatever it is, you can make one that says, hey, I'm going to be at Sundance between these dates, uh, or you know, our booth is booth number 17, whatever it is. And you are going to love these cards. They're super easy to do and make, and it's kind of fun to make them. Give it as a gift to all your employees. If you've got 20, 30, 40 employees, just tell them like I did, go to mood.com slash twist, and you can expense it because it makes people feel really good to have business cards. Think about when you were coming up and you were a nobody, and you got your first business card, it's kind of fun, right? You give it to your parents, you give it to your you know, boyfriend or girlfriend, you're like, hey, look, I've arrived, I've got a business card. It's kind of nice for people. Go ahead and do that nice thing for all your employees. Tell them to go to mood.com slash twist and get 20% off your next order. They do a bunch of other stuff there too in terms of stationery. Um, and if you're in a rush, you can get it next day on a lot of the different products they have there. I love this product. I've been using it forever. And um, super awesome. I mean, what can I say? It's the easiest and best way to make business cards, stationery, all this stuff. And they have beautiful uh, premium paper stock if you're going for that like, you know, American Psycho when they have that scene where he shows the business card and he's like, oh my my God, bone white, and look at the font style. You can go like American Psycho style, or you can go like new Moo Card Tiny style. You can go nuts. Go check it out. It has a beautiful template too. You can you can do like the template editor and do it all online. It looks gorgeous. It's worth seeing in terms of the design of the site. Um, and thank at Moo, M-O-O, obviously, on your Twitter handle. Okay, let's get back to this amazing program. Thank you, Moo. So I tend to sort of do the, you know, dog roll over and show my belly routine a lot. I'm like, I'm weak. I'm not that smart. I don't know that much. I have lots of problems. Would someone like to help me with my problems? I, I go to conferences and I talk about the problems I have with this new fidelity thing I'm building. I say, if anybody wants to be a partner, call me. I have 68 partners now. Yeah. 68 people work for me and one of them's on the payroll as of a month ago. So you actually have like, an employee. People help. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's depressing. Yeah. <laughs> and figure out how to pay them now. Um, we don't even have a company yet. Ser seriously, right. like there's no C-Corp. So the other thing you'll hear from some people is all the things you need to do to avoid looking stupid. You know, you've got a C-Corp and lawyers and accounting and whatever. Like, I don't do any of that shit. I don't do any of it. 90 plus percent odds you're going to fail. So if the books are done badly. Not the end of the world. Who, like, it's just going to be a train wreck at the end anyway. Make it a bigger train wreck. <laughs> um, I just sign NDAs. I don't read them. Who cares? No one's ever been sued over one, as far as I can tell, in California in years. Yeah. Um, like, we, we wouldn't make payroll on time because we didn't want to pay for some fucking payroll. I mean, like, the list of things we didn't do that you're supposed to do. Yeah. Uh, you know, Fastly has now gone on. I, I helped start the company about three years ago. It's a new CDN. It's crushing. And uh, we've now raised $50 million, and we still don't have a finance team, and we're 100 people. We, like, we're still finding documents we should have signed three years ago. We didn't pay tax. We didn't file taxes for the first three years. We didn't, like, the only thing I won't do is I won't pay, I will, will not forget to pay payroll taxes because you will go to jail for that. So there is have a, a very point. simple demarcation. Yeah. Like, do I go to jail? Do it. Right. If I yeah. don't go to jail, the, explain it, to me why I'm spending money on it. Right. So if the phones go off, it's not the end of the world. We, we I, I lived in daily fear that at Wikia, the landlord was going to come and recore the locks one day because we hadn't paid for four months. <laughs> You're like, like, literally every day I would come in, I'd be the first person to work every day because I wanted to be there when we were locked out to explain to people why were we locked out? Yeah. I mean, like, don't I don't pay any bill until like the red letter comes. <laughs> I've had my electricity shut off in my apartment several times. <laughs> like, this is a personal lifestyle. This isn't just a personal <laughs> lifestyle. Right? Like, I don't pay anything. Like, it's all about. I mean, cash. The cash you have in the bank is most likely all you're going to get. 
We, I don't uh, spend it on fucking anything I don't have to. <laughs> right. Efficiency Sorry, I'm off is topic. A, I know, but efficiency is important. I mean, in, in a business, you know, efficiently deploying capital in the right areas, right? I mean, being judicious with where the money goes. Does it get into the product yep. or does it get into infrastructure that does not help the product? Right. So that, I mean, that's another part of the storytelling I choose to tell, which is, you know, I would show photos of the $29 a night travel lodge hotel in my board meetings, right? Yep. And I would... Right. I mean, I, like these things are important theater. Like this is how fucking cheap we are. This is how cost efficient we are. This is how, you know, you know, when you give us a dollar, it's going to go into marketing or engineering and nothing else. Right. Right. I mean, I think Fastly was was 98 percent sales and engineering until like the the 20 million dollar round people like until they lock the doors because you didn't pay the rent and then you got an accountant yeah, yeah. Yeah. no i mean seriously like yeah. our, our first we're an enterprise company and our first user agreement was copied and pasted from a consumer site it was just wrong i mean it was wrong on many levels <laughs> no one cared yeah no one cared so they got no one cares from the service why pay a lawyer to spend a thousand dollars to write a proper terms of service like i don't know i'm busy yeah all right let's take some questions from the audience Thoughts on raising money and paying your bills on time? <laughs> Everybody's like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> He's a crazy Demont, fucker. Are you, yeah. are you concerned with inundating the 1500 with if you're taking so many investments and sending so many job requests and those sort of things? I, I'm actually concerned right now that I don't have enough <laughs> stimuli for them. Uh, we made maybe 15 investments. Um, and the job API thing isn't live yet. It's it's a uh, it's in sort of development stage. So I'm hoping it actually becomes the thing that activates these people. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, you know, these are people putting a thousand dollars or five thousand dollars into companies, and they want to <clears throat> help. And then the other thing we're doing is we're gamifying it and creating a leaderboard so that you can become awesome. And this is something I do regularly when I go out and fundraise with one of the companies I'm, I'm on the board on or pretty involved in, is I will go to a VC meeting and they will talk about the things they're going to do to help us. Hey, we're going to introduce you to this guy. Or, hey, there's this customer you should talk to. Or, hey, there's this, this. I literally take copious notes of that and nothing else they say the entire meeting. And then I send them a note that night saying, hey, I really appreciate your offer to help. Please let me know how to follow up on this intro and that contact and this thing. Eight out of ten, don't even reply. Seriously. Like, it's actually offensive. One out of two re replies, I'll get to it, maybe does one of them. And then there's, you know, the Reed Hoffmans of the world. We do all of them. Right? If they say something, and so I actually told VCs, like, if there's one thing you can do in a meeting, offer to do one thing to help and actually fucking do it. Mm. You will get so much more credit from me for that pay it forward behavior. And so my thing is, the, I'm, I would like to give the investors an opportunity to learn pay it forward, to, to get the emotional benefit of the thank you, to get the pride of being a value added investor. And with that pride, I'm gonna give disproportionate access to value added investors into future deals. People who fucking show up and do work should get to invest in the better companies. So I think it's like a really healthy recurring cycle where it becomes part of your reputation like LinkedIn. It gives you better access to deals. So an angel score. like Yeah, it's a value-add score. Like, like you know, value-add score. Yeah. This is the way I'm thinking about it. It's like you have money and you have, and you have things you can do to add value. And who wouldn't rather have an investor who adds value? And, and, and I go back to when I'm filtering for money, right? All money is good money until I have too much. And when I have too much money, I start filtering on who's emotionally involved. Like, are they leaning forward? Are they calling me instead of me calling them? Are they suggesting things? Like, are they active? Do they care? Because those people I want on, like, I don't care who they are. I don't care if they're the fucking plumber. If they're, like, willing to help, eventually I'm going to have a pipe leak. It, it definitely, it, with the dynamic of you can only have 100 people in a deal, mm -hmm. there is becoming scarcity. Oh, yeah, we're using that really well. Yeah, no, there's definitely scarcity. I mean, the deals come out and... But somebody who puts in two thousand dollars, but uses the product, gets people to use the product, helps you find employees, whatever mm -hmm. it is, helps you find business deals. Um, yeah, you you don't know exactly. It's a multiplier on the money. So yeah. It's, what is it? Helps everyone. Yeah. Right. I mean, who would you rather have, a celebrity investor or an investor who makes fifty calls a month for you? 
Like I found this out. There's a, and I, I by and large, when I'm with Jason, we all shit on VCs because it's a fun sport. Um, but there's a guy at August Capital who will remain nameless because he's awesome, and I don't want to share him. Um, who literally overwhelmed our sales team with too many leads that were all good. I've never seen that before. Like I literally, like I basically went and I was like, anything you need, any reference you need, any company of mine you want to invest in, like done. Like you're awesome. Like I can't remember the last time I said that, but I want that guy or that woman who is that involved. Gil, you talked about boards and you know investors and sort of like the people that surround founders to help, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, as founders in this early, early stage, we're super busy working you know, long hours, and but we have we are surrounded by some brilliant people that can help us. How do we as founders get the most out of an advisory board, investors, board of directors? I fucking hate advisory boards because they're people who ask for stock and don't have any skin in the game. Um, anyone who won't invest as part of being an advisor is like, I just don't get it. I, I, I you know, um, so, but okay to have somebody who invests and gets advisor. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, that's the game. Yeah. yeah. Some people play it. Um, or even these people you talked about, like, Hey, everyone, will you help me? You got 67 people who right, help you. Right. These, you, you, we're all surrounded yeah. by great people who want to help. help the cause. So yeah. how do we as founders, what, what have you seen in your experience to get the best out of these people? Is it like, yeah, how do you engage them? Yeah, I do a shitty job of it. Um, <laughs> in your observation, um, but you can tell them how to do it better. <laughs> I know. I'm looking for really tips. Grateful. But what um, you need is so um, I'm incredibly impressed by the founders who send out a monthly update oh, with too. what's oh, yeah. going on, and I find I think a monthly update is way too much work for you. So maybe it's every two or three months, realistically. I do, I think. Um, I just think it's a lot, and I think it's repetitive after a while. Um, I focus on what's wrong. Here are three things I need help with. Here's a candidate I cannot fucking find, like, or source someone for. Like, there's the investor update, and no one reads to the bottom. And so I always start at the top with like three things you can do to help. Mm -hmm. And by the way, if you want to have some context, keep reading. How to help. Like, like being um, straightforward. Yeah. Like I need help. Bryce can give people mm -hmm. examples of like monthly and weekly reports and just scrub some of the information out. Yeah. But we have one company giving us weekly reports. Oh, they Jesus just happen Christ. to have week oh. short, but it gives their week over week revenue because it happens to be like cool. good news. Yeah. Um, and stop. there's a direct correlation between <laughs> like the frequency of update and how well things are going. And when things <laughs> yeah, are not right. going well, the yeah. frequency goes it's down. Quiet. It's um. In fact, we now keep a spreadsheet. Mm. Uh, you might want to copy mm. this idea. We have a spreadsheet of every company we've invested in and the monthly update. Oh, and then we check off if they do it or not. And then we are about to tell everybody in the portfolio oh. of the last six months how many they hit, um, you know, if they didn't hit any, you know, whatever. But we did this, and you know what happened? One of the companies that hadn't been sending updates went out of business four months ago. Oops. <laughs> and they you didn't know. Didn't tell you didn't us. know. Because the I said, what happened? They said, well, the founders quit. The other, two of the three founders quit. I said, well, awesome. that happened six months ago. Okay. Yeah. Well, Thanks for letting us know. I, 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 my fear is if you create work, people will do work because they think they have to please you, and that's not necessarily what I want them doing. Yeah. There's um, definitely that. So I'm not, I'm not insistent on monthly anything. I just think, again, like I need help. Here's how I need help. Um, other tricks. Um, the Fastly guys have a daily revenue update that includes new customers and revenue from all the existing customers that goes to the team. And we send it to all the investors and people are like, that's crazy. And we're like, I don't know, it triggers them to think about us. And if they think about us, maybe they'll fucking do something for us. <laughs> if they fucking do something, maybe we'll get some benefit. So, you know, we found a simple So you do it in that report thing. anyway, you just yeah. add the group to it. Right, make you read it, do your homework. Well, I mean, I think that's the best thing about an update. Again, we, no investor wants to create additional work just for them. But that's one of the great things about when you have a plug and play type of monthly update, you can get into a format, which is, I always tell people, how many months of runway do you have left? When are you cash that's out? That's a good one. That's like number one, what I need to know as your angel investor, I think, yeah. because 
I can really help with the fundraising. <laughs> like that's yeah. a speciality. So like, just keep that top of mind. That's and also, it, it makes you look so strong. Like, we're cash out. In I can tell you right now, for one of my, you know, like, Inside.com has money until December of next year. Right. In right. my email reports to the Inside investors, so we're cash out December 2015. Yeah. Yeah. This is my plan. You know. Yeah. We'll, talk to investors in Q2 or whatever. Yeah, that's part of the transparency thing. Like, we have nine months of money left. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, those are the things I'd like right to know. Right up front, yeah. Um, or revenue, like if it's a SaaS company and there's no revenue, but there's a bunch of percentages, huge tell. Percentage symbol without the dollar number, <laughs> huge tell, right? Back to the trend line. Like, yeah, I saw a marketplace this week. They told me the transactions per month and the number of items below and above $5,000 per month, instead of telling me the sales per month. Right. So I go immediately with like, okay, there's something bad there. Like, right. I gotta suck. take the calculator out and figure out. No, what even you... with the calculator, I can't figure it out. Like they've intentionally hid something. I just don't know what. <laughs> right. Um, and I again, I tend to overshare. It is We've partly, that. Yeah. yeah, partly a uh, a overconfidence that comes from having been successful. But I'm allowed to do that, and people don't think I'm a moron. But I think also partly just like I, I, I come across very naively and I go, hey, like, here's what I got. I need help. I need advice. What would you do? Um, I also find no one ever wants to give you negative feedback ever because it makes them sad to give it and it makes you sad to receive it. So you'll have a lot of investor meetings where people nod and smile and then you leave and you lost. Mm -hmm. So I won't leave a meeting until I get one piece of critical feedback. Like, tell me something I did wrong. Tell me something I should do differently. Tell me something I should fix. What's the biggest flaw here? What am I not seeing? Like, like, and I'm just fucking merciless. Like, I will not let that douchebag out of the room <laughs> until he's told me something that I have didn't know. That he actually <laughs> felt. <laughs> or I hear it seven times and I'm like, okay, I'm actually wrong. Like, seven people in a row think I'm an idiot. Good to know. Now I know something I have to go fix. Like one person tells me, and it's it's a Rorschach test, right? Everybody has their own interpretation of what you're doing wrong. Sure. You know, if I get it often enough, I'm like, okay, yeah, this shit really does suck. I mean, this is like. Well, it goes back to like true friends, right? Like a true friend will tell you when you're acting like a schmuck. Sometimes. I will use oh, <laughs> true friend. They'll tell you like, hey, schmuck, like this is bad, right? Like, and I think that candidness is like it's really. I, I'm interested, investor to investor, mm -hmm. how you deal with this. The founder is doing something brain dead stupid. You can see it so clearly. You've seen this movie before, you know how it is. And you have to be the person to tell them like, hey, you're making this huge mistake, here's the rationale. But none of the other people are giving them the bad news. And so then you're the investor who's, you know, has to have the sad conversation. Mm -hmm. And everybody else is having the upbeat conversation, giving high fives, and I don't wanna be the guy who's like bringing you down and giving you a hard time. How do you handle that as an investor? Well, you're just blunt, so you don't. I don't of, really uh, give a shit. <laughs> yeah, I, see, I think we're covering the same cloth. Yeah. But you do experience this with the other investors, are yeah. like in Aspen, and they're like, "Keep rocking," and they don't give any. Like, no, it's true, right? So, so like, we had a board meeting at one of these companies, and everyone has a different priority, and everyone has different advice. And I finally just got up on the fucking whiteboard, and I was like, "Okay, three things make the top three lists. What are they?" Because I got 12 so far, and I couldn't get an answer. And finally, I was like, can we vote? And they're like, no, we don't want to vote. <laughs> and I'm like, really? So we're just not going to make a decision. We'll just put everything on the table and no culpability, no, but no ownership. You know, my, my old saying is a committee is the only animal with many stomachs and no brain. Yeah. Um, people don't want to take responsibility. They don't want to express an opinion that could, that could tag them for future responsibility, you know, future negativity. Yeah. Um, and I just keep forcing the issue. I'm like, okay, like we can't leave until we have three priorities. Ha <laughs> ha. Like, what are we going to do? It seems kind of dumb to leave the CEO with 12 top, top one priorities, doesn't it? And they're like, oh, well, you know, corporations, they can do a lot of things. And so I was like, okay, what is this person, the CEO, what is his top three priorities for the next two months? Can we tell him that? Would that be helpful maybe? Yeah. Like you don't get it. And, and, and my argument is you, if you don't get it, like I don't know how many of you have been an employee and not gotten feedback. I had a boss who was great at not giving me feedback and then not promoting me. Well, guess what? I should have asked for feedback. And if I didn't get it, I should have asked louder. 
Our boss is pretty good with feedback. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a prick. Um, right? So. Like, I want fucking feedback. We're all learning individuals. We all make mistakes. We, you don't get better by, like, dancing along, you know, with your underwear hanging out the back. Someone should tell you. Yeah. Jason will, but yeah. I will, but yeah. not many people will. Okay, another question. More questions. Yes, How do you decide which meetings to take? So you get, you get inundated with all these people who want to show you their company and pitch to you. How do you decide which ones to take and which ones not? Hmm. So I now have 64 people, 68 people, some number of people I can't even track anymore to help. Um, so most VCs, so let's differentiate Gil's crazy world from normal investors. Um, normal investors seem to be very interested in getting referrals. Right. So when I was just an angel, one of my shticks was, if you cold call me and I have 3,000 friends on LinkedIn, it means you know nobody. <laughs> like, if you can't find a warm intro to me, what the fuck? Like, really? Um, so warm intro, elevator speech, you know, and a bio. Like, who are you? What are you doing? And why should I take a meeting? Is sort of the filter a lot of VCs use. My favorite VC firm of late on this topic is Benchmark. Go to their website. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. They're like, don't call us. <laughs> Literally. Like, it's awesome how horrible yeah. their website is. Um, like, What's the theory behind it? You'll, I don't know. Yeah. They're like, like they're don't really call us. What they do, right? Like, here's not our list of partners. We don't <laughs> want you to know who they are. Because um, then you might call them. Um, so I think that helps. We take a lot more inbound, um, and that's why I have uh, 54 associate partners who take a meeting, look at the deck, just sort of do some initial screening, and then 14 uh, syndicate level partners who do more detailed screening, and they're vertical experts in whatever it is you're doing. Um, and so I don't see shit anymore. I mean, by the time I see anything, it's almost always been decided and it's kabuki theater and my job is selling. And that's true of most senior partners at most firms. They don't fucking meet with you. They come and they kiss your ass because the firm's already decided and their job is to like convince you to take their money over some other douchey white guy with black and blue jackets. Um, so, you know, that that's sort of a, a, a quick way of thinking about it. Um, another humor point for you is, as an entrepreneur, I will never send a deck to someone. Hey, send us a deck. We'll take a look. Well, if you don't have time to meet with me, if you're not interested enough to find out my story, if I haven't done a good job of explaining why you should meet with me through this connection that we share, through my story in the email, through whatever, then like I'm just giving up confidential information for no reason uh, to someone I don't know. Uh, as a syndicate lead, I ask for that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. And honestly, we probably won't meet with you until we've seen a deck because we get so many goddamn decks. But there are exceptions, right? If Jason says, hey, this is a great company, like, would you please meet with them? Like, I'm like, ah, oh, fine. <laughs> fine. I will meet with them, but, but yeah. you owe me. Like, no, but I mean, if between angels, if somebody says meet with the company, you take the meeting. Even then, not. I, um, some of my VC friends who are really good at this now, I get like an auto reply almost. I'll be like, hey, you should be with this candidate, company, whatever. And the response I get back is, is this guy or company a nine or a 10? And I have to sit back and think. And most of the time I'm like seven, eight. And that company was Uber or Larry Page from Google or but like everybody's like, a seven, like Twitter, yeah, seven, Uber taxi, seven. Yeah. But even so, right, like they're Twitter trying, like they're, get, they're trying to get a sense of, do you send everyone to me? Mm -hmm. uh, I got you. It <clears throat> sounds like a Reed Hoffman send, response. I, yeah, it's a very much a Reed Hoffman response. Because like if I keep sending Reed tens, yeah. after a while, he's going to stop taking my meetings because he's seen what my tens look like and they ain't that good. Mm -hmm. Um, so some level of high level filtering. Yeah. So even there, you need calibration of like, is this really a meeting you want me to take? Like, I did this to a friend. One of my syndicate backers wanted an intro to a big publicly traded company where I know one of the VPs. So I passed him on. I was like, hey, you guys should be. 
like two days later, I get a note back from the guy at big public company who goes, the guy's kind of crazy. Like, are you real? Like, should I really meet with him? And I was like, honestly, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> like, 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 I was just being polite and wanted to do an introduction and like, I was just like being social. People are very persnickety about the introduction thing. Yeah. And everybody's got their own set of rules. Yep. Yeah. And everybody's got their own style. I think the best practice is to figure it out. But clearly, the number one way is trusted referral. Yep. That's just hands down the number one way. But, you know, like I will not, and I've had this, there's a lot of debates that go on on our side of the table with these intros. Like some people demand that you ask before an intro. Mm -hmm. I demand that if I introduce somebody you treat that I've invested in, you take the meeting. And I've had people say like, I had somebody CC like another part, like a more junior partner, and I wrote back to them. I said, you know, I don't appreciate you when I send you one of my investments, sending it to a junior partner. I'm unlikely to send you people in the future if you do this again, because it makes me look really bad. Arr. And I was just like, other person was like, I get it. I was like, I'm not. I mean, I've only sent you five companies, and by the way, of the last five, Zynga, Twitter, Uber, and Thumbtack were in those last five. So, by the way, you passed on like two of the four, and you invested in two of the four. So, like you, you know. Yeah. Treat my intros different than like a lawyer's intros. No offense, or an accountant's, or a headhunter's. Um, no, it's true. Like uh, I love the people who are like, "Hey, this person wants to meet you. Would you like? Are you okay to me doing an introduction?" And I hate the people who are like, "Hey, you two should meet." Yeah, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> that's me. But so, but the other thing is, how you get introduced is also, and the why. So, a lot of people say, "Hey, can you introduce me to Gil or whatever?" People come to me here. Why exactly are, do you think this is a fit? Like really putting your thought into that is critical. So when somebody who's in my portfolio says, or even a friend says, I want to meet with Bill Gurley of Benchmark because Bill was an investor at eBay, Uber, and this other marketplace, Dog Vacay. I have a marketplace that's very similar in, the, in this aspect. And I read the book, E-Boys, about him. And he was a quote in there where he said this. I think it would be a fit. I'm like, that's going to be a really easy email to forward. Right? It's a very e easy intro. I have people email me, literally, and they're like, can we go have lunch with Elon Musk? Can you interest me with Mark Cuban? Is Travis from Uber available? And I'm like, is Travis for available what on reason? Tuesday right? like, at 6? You don't need to meet with Elon. There's nothing you need to meet with Elon Musk, Mark Cuban, or Travis about. Yeah. Like, why? You know, unless you're making solar panels, you have something like a player you're trading to the Dallas Mavericks. <laughs> you know, or... I, I actually had the worst one yet uh, yesterday. I had a call with a guy from an uh, online lending company. And neither of us knew why we were on the phone. <laughs> I shit you not. This is Gail. Someone hey, had Steve. suggested we talk. Go ahead, Gail. And he starts in with like, hey, how can I help you? And I was like, I don't know. I thought I was here to help you. All right. Uh, what are your problems? Uh, <laughs> what problems are you having in your and he's life? Like, he's like, do you remember who introduced us? And I'm like, honestly, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, talk like feeling of, like a moron. I mean, Jesus. There's a level of insanity to the to the whole meeting thing, and I have always wanted to be uh, talking as an entrepreneur. Now, I always love information uh, asymmetry, so I want to know everything mm. about whoever I'm meeting with, and I want to meet with very specific people of, about very specific things, and everything I do is very tailored to those people. It is not like herky jerky or mm. just shotgun. Um, so I've done that my whole career. When I wanted to raise money for Mahalo, I said, who did Google? <coughs> okay, it was John Doerr and Michael Moritz. Those are the two people I need to meet with. And I said, who did my last company, Mark Cuban? Those are the three people I emailed with Mahalo. Those are the three people I met with. One of the three funded it. And I tailored the pitch to exactly who I was talking so, to. So since not everyone here can call those three people. Uh, well, you know, at that time, you know what? I was not who I am now. Yeah, you was Here's done okay with the blog No, but thing, he, I had done okay with the blog thing, but this is the email I sent. And... Dear Michael, we met very briefly a year, yeah. two years ago at a conference. You probably don't remember me. I sold my last company after 18 months for $30 million to AOL. I have a new idea um, that I, I think that you time. could give me, uh, uh, that I think yeah. you would be very interested in. Um, I can meet anytime for 15 or 20 minutes, uh, any day of the week. Let me know. 
Okay. And I specifically cool. did that like any day of the week, any time, 15 minutes. I would probably still He say called that. me back on two different lines and left two f- long messages. Uh, and I was in their office within two days. John Doris, people call another per- a person from John Doris' office called back in two days. So if you write the email properly. Maybe. <coughs> so a different. You might version. get the meeting. Um, I had a uh, guy tell me once. You should come up with a list of people you want to get to know mm. and have like a quarterly schedule of reaching out to them, you know, send them something that's relevant, give them an mm-hmm. update, do something, sort of build a relationship with them by email. Um, it's a Mark Suster, connect the dots. Very much so. Yeah. And and I used to joke, so I was early at eBay and at one point I was a business development dude and there were five people whose time I wanted and I would call them every day or I would call someone who knew them to try to like I was con- I was just merciless always trying to find a way to <clears throat> get to that person influence them get them done we went public a year later and 500 people had me on their top five list and I couldn't fucking get anything done because <laughs> everyone was harassing me and I was constantly in, like in meetings and trying to say no to people so if you've sat on both sides of the table you know Jason's point <coughs> is acknowledge that person is busy Acknowledge they may staff it out to someone, like be be resp- respectful of their time, explain to them why it's worth their time, like and and like be like, hey, it's fine if you don't want to meet now. I just love to give your advice, but you know, if if, if now is not a good time, I'll ping you in another month, right? Like I've just that's the merciless side, right? Is you just keep going. And there aren't many people who just keep trying every month. And that I think the important people it takes three, four, five. Contacts, touch points. Yeah. Um, I, I also think um, engaging with them on social media and stalking them a wee bit. You know, like let's say Bill Gurley's your guy. You, you, you want him on your board. He's a dream investor. You know, starring his stuff, writing an intelligent comment when he writes a blog post. Writing a blog post of your own where you quote Bill Gurley. Yeah. Having a branded blog for your site. You know, the power of marketplaces. I was reading a Bill Gurley post. He said this. I thought that was particularly interesting in relation to this. If you know about Bill Gurley, here's where to meet him. And then that level of, and then my super trick, which I do to this day, except I'm doing it for different purposes, is I go into Twitter. I follow a lot of people, but I turn on mobile notifications for the person. The mobile notification comes on, I get an alert. Nice. That this CEO just posted something portfolio company or a company I want to invest in. I go to it, boom, I store it. So you might see me going and storing stuff and I'm the first person to do it. Mm-hmm. You're like, Jason's an Android. I said, people doing this? Mm-hmm. It's like, no. Or you have that alert turned on. Mm-hmm. I Anytime you do something, I go, I store it, I retweet it, I reply. So I use SendMail, which, uh, is it SendMail? Uh, no, 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 no. Same mail. Same mail, which I think has the send later mm-hmm. feature. So all my email <coughs> for stalking is sent at 4 a.m. Uh, so it's the first thing in your mailbox when you wake up in the morning because it allows me to schedule at 4 a.m. And by the way, that's yet another reason why everyone thinks I'm crazy because I'm up at 4 a.m. every day. <laughs> Not really, but no. software lets Going me. to bed at 1. Right? <laughs> Finishing off those emails. and Genius. Right. All right. Uh, one more question. Anybody have anything else? All right. Best pitch you ever heard. Yeah. Good question. Quickest yes. Know. Quickest yes. It's like another way to. I don't know. It's it's that's not an easy one to answer. I mean, in in what attribute? Like most impressive team story storytelling. One that sticks out. Um, so I'm investing in Stand uh, in January. And Stand is a fundraising app, and I didn't want to meet with them, and they didn't have any data, and they didn't send me a deck. And the usual suspects forced me to take a meeting, and the guy comes in and he says, I want to tell you about my daughter. When my daughter was 10, she saw this story about the genocide in Syria, or, and uh, she said, Mom, Dad, I'm going to open up a lemonade stand. And I'm going to sell lemonade until I raise $100,000. And this is the dad talking to me. And he goes, what are you supposed to do? Like, we helped her set up a lemonade stand. And she went out every day and sold lemonade. And on day 51, the New York Times picked it up. And she raised $100,000. And now we're trying to build an app to let everyone engage people in fundraising around a cause that they're passionate about. 
I was like, yeah, I, like, I have to give you money. Like, I, <laughs> yeah, it's just Fuck. too personal. <laughs> way too personal, way too powerful. Right, like, yeah. wow. Like, how, how much trouble are you going to have recruiting? Yeah. How much trouble are you going to have getting PR? Now, how did you legally um, send... You know the investment of a million dollars to a ten-year-old. Yeah. yeah. How does a twelve-year-old become CEO? No, no, no. Are there no, child no, labor no, laws no, involved? No. In, uh, I don't think the child. Labor, I don't think she has a salary. I'm sure she's probably the CEO. Um, yeah. She's just chair, chairman of the board. Yeah, she probably has some exec chair, some role like that. It's <laughs> not regulated. I found out I couldn't take a dollar a year salary when I was here. Speaking of ridiculous shit. Yeah. The, yeah. the communist city of San Francisco will not allow me to pay myself a dollar a year. You're breaking the uh, labor laws. I break the labor laws. So I had to get a, what was it, a 15 million percent raise from a dollar to like $15,000 a year, which was minimum wage. And I agreed to work no more than 30 hours a week. Hmm. You were putting in 90. Yeah. All right. Very well done. Let's hear it for Gil. All right. So you've done two startups, obviously, and they had Hitmonk. The nature of startups has changed greatly since you got in the game. Yes. Um, how has it changed in your mind? I think everybody's smarter. Um, you know, when now a, a lot of this is, I, I guess, kind of looking at my own peer group. Yeah. You know, because when we all got in the game, we were all in our early twenties. Now we're all in our early thirties, and we've learned to be more tactical um, about what we're doing and why we're doing it. It's not enough just to do something fun. It's not enough just to do something that I, I, I would like to exist. Um, you really need to think about how you're going to exist as a business very early on. You don't have to necessarily be behaving like a business. Hmm. Right? There, there's, I, there's still plenty of companies that grow, you know, get users first, monetize them later, but you should know what that plan is right off the bat because it's very, very unlikely that you're gonna get to build something like Reddit or Snapchat, where it just grows and grows and grows and grows, and it like masks all of these other problems, like, oh, we never thought about the business. Right. Like, we, I was very, very fortunate to have been a part of that. I don't think you can do it on purpose with, with as much certainty as you can do just about anything else on purpose. Right. And so let's talk about the tactical stuff. What are the top tactical things that you spend your time on now? Um, <clears throat> we spend a lot of time on basically two things, optimizing our user acquisition, which is a huge pain in the ass in travel, but that's the name of the game. And it, every business, right, how are you gonna acquire users? How much does it cost? How can you like do that better than your competitors? And we spend a lot of time on conversion funnels on our site, like tons of time. We've gotten much, much better in the last year about organic users, paid users, Yahoo users. They all have very different behaviors. Who's the most valuable? Who's the cheapest to get on our site? Who converts the best? Like, how do we gear our products like towards them? So when we started Hitmonk, I was still very much shoot from the hip. What's the product that I want to use? What makes my life easier? And now it's much more like, where are our cheapest users? What do what resonates with them? How do we like? optimize for, for them. So it's, it sounds like it's shifted from like an art or alchemy to science. Very much. Um, there's still, and, and well, okay, the other side of that coin is, you know, we do test just about everything at Hitmonk and any argument that we can, we can, we can test the answer of, we try not to have in person. You know, the whole like, you know, I don't want to hear, I think it should do this, I think it should do that. But the the other side of that argument is there are some things you just cannot test, or we don't have the infrastructure to test, and then you still have to go with your gut. Right. Like, what is the, you know, we had this argument at Hitmonk not too long ago. You go to our front page, and if we had like an interstitial that asked for your email address, well, there's no test that we're going to run that isn't going to come back with, we collect a shit ton more emails. Like, we know that right. it's going to happen. It will increase emails. Um, yes. Um, is that the correct thing to do? Probably not. We're still kind of relying on our gut for that. Like we're, we've kind of asked the user for a favor before we offered them anything in return. That that's usually how I try to frame these sorts of things. Where like, is it going to hurt retention? Is it going to hurt like overall kind of loyalty? Is our NPS going to drop a little bit? The more of those things we can measure, the better. But we can't measure everything. So we always try to be really honest with ourselves about what we can measure and what we can't. Although now we've included NPS in all of our experiments, and it's been really. Um, really interesting. NPS is Net Promoter Score. Um, 
and everybody knows net promoter score. Anybody not know it by chance? Okay, so everybody definitely, you don't know it? Yeah, so net promoter score. Helps yeah, me. so the way we do it on Hitmon, this, this is a common marketing thing these days, um, is you ask a user um, on a scale of 0 through 10, how likely, are, how likely are you to recommend this to your friends? Or how likely are you to recommend it? Um, eight, nines, and tens, those are considered, oh no, maybe it's just nines and tens, those are yeah. promoters. Uh-huh. Zero through six are detractors. You take the percentage of promoters so minus the percentage of detractors, and that's your NPS score. Um, so the range is negative 100 to 100. Um, we hover around 60-ish for most of our products, um, which is pretty decent. Um, but we know it could be better. And But a lot of the experiments we do now on the site, we um, we look at how it affected NPS, because it doesn't always affect conversion, but sometimes NPS goes up or down, which is really interesting. So a little pop-up comes up and says, yeah, yeah. take the survey. Yeah, we do it um, on Hitmonk. Um, 5% of our users get into this bucket. Every, we rebucket it every month. And it's like half new user and half returning users. And we ask after you've been on the site, after you've seen results for about 10 seconds, it pops up. And, um, and it asks you, and then it asks you for like feedback. It's really, really helpful actually to start um, like quantifying user sentiment. Um, and most users are actually happy to participate in this. Yeah, and, and it makes managing the company easier for you um, in terms of, I guess, religious wars, I guess. Well, we want to remove the emotion from arguments. Yeah. I hate email boxes. I think it's just bad for users so, well, right. versus, oh, but we can collect email addresses and those are worth $2 a piece. Like, like people get these like, Emotional and like people walk out of rooms, they get all huffy puffy. Like, right. um, not great for culture. No, it's not. So, <laughs> to the extent that we can push those arguments into something we can test, it, much better. Yes. So, let's talk about funding today. Um, there's a lot of money out there, mm-hmm. there's a lot of competition. How has that changed? Um, fundraising is overall a lot easier. Yeah. Right? Investors, rich people, VCs are more comfortable investing in startups earlier and earlier and earlier. The the amount of money to get a startup off the ground is less and less and less. So by the time like you're raising angel money, the ideas are generally, I think, much more baked than they would have been 10 years ago. Like people can have an app, they can have a prototype, they can have AWS hosting, whatever. Um, so in general, I think the, the market has gotten a lot more efficient. The investors have gotten a lot more savvy. They ask smarter questions, and as a result, founders are thinking about those questions earlier. So overall, I think the ecosystem is much healthier. There's right. more money being spent on more good things, which I think is good for everybody. What are the things that clue people into, I need to invest, and what are the tells that make people say, this is just not fundable? There are, there are two things that cause me to want to invest. You're working on a problem that I am emotionally attached to, like the group texting thing. Like, I can see it so clearly. I see the whole product in my head. The only reason I'm not working on it is because I'm working at Hitlock. Like, there's a class of startups where I just, like, I, I, I want it to exist so bad, and I want to have influence over somebody competent working on it. And the second part is that competency. Like, is that founder a winner? Like, that's, I, that is most of, I feel like, the questions I ask when I'm looking at somebody for interviewing are, like, trying to determine... Are you smart? Have you thought about this? And how do you respond to it? adversity? Right. right. I always try to say something negative about their idea to see, like, how do they handle it? Yeah, we saw. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we witnessed it. And how do they do? <laughs> overwhelmingly very, uh, very, very good, right? It's just, like, are they, are they arrogant enough to believe they can succeed where everybody around them is failing and humble enough to give up when they know it's time to move on. That is, I think, a very fine line, and the best founders walk it really, really well. Right. Um, And so tells that somebody or an idea are not fundable. Like, what are the things when you see them, you go, you know, why are you even talking to angel investors now? Or you got to get these things fixed before you even go. Um, If they're too malleable, I start saying, I was like, oh, oh, that idea is stupid. You should do this. I'm like, yeah, I I should. Yeah, the idea was stupid. I should do this. And they're basically like, it's like, Like, you, you, they, you don't want the, the tail to wag the dog too much. Yeah. Um, you want them to be really confident in what they're doing. Like, but again, walking a line, right? If confronted with the fact that their thing is stupid, um, you know, they'll, they'll change their mind. Um, general, I mean, general kind of selling 101, right? General nervousness, like lack of confidence, stuttering through things, not, not having thought through these questions, not having anticipated my questions. We all ask the same questions. So that's, those are all like 
I think negative signs. Yeah. So you move the light pointer and the cat like chases yeah, I think it. And it's being like, too defensive. Yeah. Um, yeah. I thought you actually walked the line really well of like when both of us were harping on you about oh second tier events. Like nope. and I think it's it's <laughs> like it's good to say nope because I have data. Right? I nope, nope, you're wrong. It's 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 actually the opposite. Um, that's a good way of handling that sort of criticism. Um, if you didn't have that sort of like if you didn't actually have tickets to premiere things, your response would be one of two things. It'd be like, maybe you're right, or you're probably wrong, and I know how to test it. Right? I'm going to try to get events to premiere things, and if I succeed, I succeed. If I don't, you're right. Right? There's no, like, I have no, I'm not trying to win an argument. Right? I have, I have, like, I'm just, I'm just giving you honest feedback, and some people take it as honest feedback. Some people right. take it as, a, as an argument. Yeah, and it's almost like if you think about. The angel investor as part of your team, and as you're saying earlier, like, hey, can we run a test on it? Like that was the dialogue that we started to have. Like, oh yeah, you, there would be a way to test this, or what would be a way to test this, yeah. or how might we test this? Or yeah. I thought that too until we got 200 Beck tickets. Yep. You know, period. Yep. I, I, I think, think that's a really that's that's the feedback loop you should be operating in every day. And what about growth? I'll end on that. I mean, you are now uh, having to scale your business. That's how you're being judged. You got you're in the yep. B round, I think. C. Now going on to C. So, are you being judged just on pure growth, and then how does that affect what you do? You know, in terms of yeah. your investment, because it is is now the whole budget going from hey we're, we built a product to hey scaling and growth? Yeah, more or less. Um, you know, our first couple rounds were basically me and Adam pitching ourselves, the emotional feeling of the product, hey, look, this product is so much better, our competitors are stupid, that sort of argument, to now it's like, here's how much revenue we're making, here's our margins, like, and our investors are really holding our asses to the fire on, we need to triple revenue next year, right? That's, like, if we don't, we may as well be, like, we should look for an exit because we're just wasting everybody's time. And that has caused us to, we work on different things now, like, there's lots of revenue quick hits. Like right now, the reason I gotta leave in a, um, in a moment is we're trying to cram, cram through as many revenue increasing product updates in December so that we can hit January, our biggest growth month, gross growth month with everything in place. And that's infected the entire company. Okay, one question from the audience and then he goes. Who's got a great one? Uh, your best growth mechanism. Okay. Best growth mechanism. Um, at Hitmonk, let's see, we did not appreciate the value of emails and, by extension, push notifications for too long. It's, it's, I, I feel stupid saying that because like, it's not a secret. <laughs> right? yeah. Everybody should know this. We did not take it seriously. Um, like, an email address is so valuable. And, if, and then well-crafted emails, it's a free marketing channel. Like, like you can blast these people just about as often as you like, and if you send them good content, it's just free. For us, for our business, it's very, very important. People travel, most people travel only once or twice a year. Hitmonk is a stupid name, it's hard to remember. So we've gotta to stay top of mind until, like when they're ready to make that travel decision, we're, we're in their brains. Emails, push notifications are easy to collect, super valuable. Awesome, let's hear it. Good job.